All right. Hello, everyone. Um, glad you could join us this morning uh, for this session. Um, typically, at this meeting, you, you have a lot of people with PowerPoints, and they're up here talking, and you sit here listening, and, and hopefully that won't be the case for this. Um, it's hopefully going to be more of an interactive session where you can ask questions, uh, banner back and forth. The original um, intent of this uh, was driven by the Student Affairs uh, Committee, and I'm the industry rep, uh, Michael Litke, uh, for the, Indus uh, the Student Affairs Committee, and this is? I'm Ashley Weaver, and I'm a, actually a graduate student, but I'm serving on the Student Affairs Committee. And, and what we were asked to do was try to do something to help um, the industry chapters mix better with the student chapters, or at least try to provide an industry perspective to all, let's say, BMES student chapters across America. Now, that's kind of ambitious and, and lofty, um, and probably some of you don't even know the industry chapters even exist. So um, the hope today is to introduce ourselves a bit as the Boston BMES industry chapter and uh, you know, describe that program a little bit um, as we have quite a few people here as well. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Pittman here. Um, he's going to go through uh, the slides to kind of give us a bit of a setup and premise here. But the overall intent with this is for you to ask us questions that you normally couldn't. And by assembling this panel here, um, we have quite a few people with diverse backgrounds, and we'll introduce ourselves later as we go down the line. Um, but you know, feel free to ask questions because we want to help you understand the situation, or at least uh, allow us to fully communicate the premise of gaps um, that we're addressing. All right, good morning. So uh, we're going to go into like a little bit more detailed introductions of the panel, but uh, this, um, these are the people participating. We do have uh, three members here from our Boston chapter, uh, Michael, uh, Gabby, and myself, and um, also a, uh, a graduate student at Wake Forest University who has ind industry experience. Um, so I'm going to let each person uh, introduce himself, kind of like what they're doing now and maybe a few steps they took along the way uh, to get to that point. But I think maybe what I'll do is just very briefly go over uh, our, um, our chapter in, uh, in Boston and uh, the agenda and then we'll come back to those introductions. So uh, um, I'd like to give you just a, a brief overview of our chapter and one of our kind of pillars, which is student outreach. We also want to talk about internships and why those are very important for you in that transition from being a student to, to potentially working in the industry, but it also can be helpful if you're pursuing an academic track. And then we're going to reserve time for uh, a Q&A afterwards. Um, so this is our kind of a, like a strategy map um, for our chapter in Boston. We have an executive committee uh, with three members here today. Uh, we have at-large members, but our real focus is on, you know, driving membership, continuing education, and then student outreach. So if you're someone working in industry, you want to give back to your profession, you know, you can individually work on student outreach or you can do it as a part of a more, like, focused effort. So that's what we're doing in Boston. Um, I mentioned that we uh, do different activities. So one is a um, job shadow. So we organize opportunities for students to go in and spend a half day at a company, uh, different companies. Uh, we also uh, will collect three or four members and go to a, a specific like student chapter and talk about you know, our different roles in the industry. And then um, we also have these evening forums and we always invite students to attend those as well. And so we have those at a combination of different companies and also uh, uh, universities as well. Um, so just real quickly, uh, this idea of you know, concentrations within BME and also internships. We actually did a, uh, what it, we called a gap analysis where we actually reached out to alumni, recent graduates and people that had been working in industry for a while and just asked them some questions about what was important. And one of the things we asked about was, were concentrations within BME. And that was something that you know, had relevance. Uh, 
it probably wasn't the most important thing, but it's something you might want to think about if you're in the early stages and can concentrate. It just allows you to kind of define yourself more than just taking introductory courses. Uh, but then there's also the opportunity opportunity to do internships. And uh, there was a pretty good response that, you know, that actually, if you did it, the, the response was favorable. But if even if you didn't, it, you felt like if you had completed an internship, it would have been very beneficial. So I think that was about 80% of the respondents. So that's something you probably want to think about. Um, and so uh, as far as... So this is something more specific that Michael contributed. So let's do this. Let's go back to the, uh, the panel. Um, I mentioned just briefly who's participating. And what I would like each panelist to do is just uh, talk about you know, what you do in your current role today and maybe one or two things along the way that helped get you from being a student to the position that you have today. OK. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And then just a little bit more background um, information about the industry chapters. Um, they were started as a pilot program. There are four of them. Um, there's one in Boston, one in Minneapolis, St. Paul, one in Houston, and one in, is it San Jose? Um, California. And they're started as a pilot program to get more industry involvement into BMES. Um, not that it is more academic in nature, but it, it tends to have quite a few students and graduate students involved with it. But um, about my background and what Stephen was saying, I'm Michael Litke. I work at Cobman and Shirtliff. It's a division of Johnson & Johnson, and I'm a clinical research associate right now. Um, I went to undergrad at Syracuse University. I was a biomedical engineering instrumentation focus, and then I did graduate work um, that j, j paid for at uh, Drexel University, um, and I have a, my master's in biomaterials and bioimaging uh, from Drexel. And I guess part of why my perspective and background that's relevant to this panel is I've had quite a few internships that helped me land an industry job. And if anything, I had two of them at Johnson & Johnson before I was hired on full time. And I think that's my perspective to this particular panel and what I want to share with everyone that's in here. Um, I feel strongly that it's important um, as a recruiter and, and someone that's actually hiring college hires um, to have some sort of internship experience on your resume is one of those things uh, that we look for and help screening. Um, because as you well know, the economy is driving competition quite high for positions. They're few and far between, and it's tougher and tougher to get into industry if that's something that you want to do. So hopefully um, landing an internship and then planning things uh, can help you get along in that particular perspective. So Stephen, tell us a little bit about yourself. So, um, so I work for Philips. Uh, Philips is in lighting, com uh, consumer devices, but then also uh, healthcare. Um, so I work in uh, the division that's focused on primarily uh, pulmonary medicine. So we develop ventilators and devices that assist people with breathing. Uh, we also do diagnostics. Uh, what I do on a daily basis is, um, so I'm a career biomedical engineer. I've, you know, on my tax return listed for occupation in biomedical engineer for 25 years. Um, but I've kind of, over the years, have evolved where now I'm not so much focused just on developing a medical device. I'm, you know, launching ventures that are, you know, developing and marketing those devices. So I have that kind of business role now. Um, but I'll say, like, along the way, uh, some things that have had a real impact on me uh, would be just very early. I started working with physician scientists, and I find that where I really differentiate myself is being kind of the liaison between the company and the functional engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, the physicists, all those specialists, and the physician scientist who's the leader in his field in the world. And the two of us work it out where he liaisons to the clinical uh, people in his field. I liaison to the more functional engineers. And together we form teams to basically go after something that doesn't exist and to create, you know, an iPhone or you know something that was really differentiates itself from everything else to solve some unique problem. So it's that you know linking with physician scientists I think that's has been a big impact on, on my career and also it's just being willing to take risk. Um, I think that a lot of people go after you know being safe and uh, trying to 
uh, be associated with a project that's a sure win because they feel like if they're associated with that, that that is going to be the pathway to success. I would argue just opposite. You want to go after the riskiest project that chances are it's going to fail. And if you actually determine that something is a failure faster than you know spending five years on it, you've actually saved your company a, a lot of money and effort. Um, but if it wins, you know, you're the guy that actually was willing to take that risk, and it really can differentiate yourself. So those are just the two things I think that have had an impact on my career. Um, so I'll pass it on to Gabby. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Gabriel Griono, Gabby. Um, my background is very interesting. <laughs> that, that gave me a, a good, a good uh, experience with the, with the academia and, and industry. So I actually have a bachelor's in mathematics from Romania. And then I, I have a, a master's degree in veterinary biomedical sciences, which got me introduced to, to biology. And uh, then I went to Tucson, Arizona, to get a PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Arizona. After that, after a short postdoc, um, right from the, from the bench, from the lab, I went up to Flagstaff in Arizona to work for Gore Medical. So it's the, the medical division of uh, Gore, who made the Gore-Tex, who, who has a Gore-Tex jacket. Yeah, okay. Not too many people knew that, don't know that Gore has a strong medical uh, division. So uh, I went there and worked as a product specialist. How many of you have uh, attended the last night uh, alumni panel? Because the, uh, I heard there was somebody from Gore there describing this. Um, Quite unique um, uh, job uh, function, the product specialist, which allows basically which allows the somebody with a PhD in biomedical engineering to go straight into a um, product management position. That's what the product specialist is. That's quite unique because most of the companies, for a product manager, you have to have some sales background or some or MBA. So from the from the lab, I went. Uh, you know, the next day I had a business plan in my hands and like. <laughs> <laughs> figure it out how, or for a new development, for a new product development. It was a 50-page uh, business plan. So I did that for two and a half years, and I consider that my, my MBA, my hands-on MBA, because that gave me a chance to, to, you know, to learn about commercialized products and also about uh, new development. So I can talk more about that uh, if you have questions. Well, uh, I felt like for, it was for family reasons, but I also felt that the industry, honestly, is... It uh, was kind of restrictive for me. I felt like I'm in the best uh, creative years of my life, and I felt like academia is a, is a better and bigger creative uh, playground, honestly. So I went back to academia from there. I went to get a postdoc at the, in the Department of Surgery at the Indiana, School of, uh, Indiana University School of Medicine, Indianapolis, and I had a chance there to do some basic, sci basic uh, research but I also wanted to use my experience from industry to uh, get involved in uh, uh, new product development. And um, I did that with, with some doctors. We, we got something started. Um, and then um, last year I moved to, to MGH uh, in Boston, which again, it's even a nicer playground in terms of biotech and, uh, and, I, got, and I got in touch with the Boston industry chapter. So I, I served in the in the board of directors for the Biomedical Engineer Society for the last three years. So I knew about the, the industry chapters, but I honestly, I never had a chance to, to know in, in detail about them. And you know, I had a really good surprise to see that they're, they're very active. And there's a totally different interaction at the local level with industry, where it's, it's relatively easier to bring people from industry to our uh, evening meetings in, in the city, in the same city than it is to bring them to these meetings. So, you know, if you have a chance to get involved with the industry chapters, and you don't have to be in Boston, I mean, we would like to hear from you, even if you are all over the, the country, because, you know, geographically you won't be able to, to be where the meetings are, but we'd like to hear from you, and uh, we want to steer this, like, like Steven said and, and Michael, we want to steer this, our efforts towards better integrating you in the industry or even academia. We had the um, job shadow a couple of weeks ago and we had somebody from, um, you know, uh, 
uh, from Tufts University who's going to graduate in the in the summer and he wants to do a master's so he wanted to see how um, how a lab is and what what does the you know uh, well science work in the lab involves and so forth so that's my introduction Hi, I'm Caitlin Weaver. I'm currently a PhD student at Wake Forest University in the Center of Injury Biomechanics. Before that, I have my bachelor's and two master's degrees from New Jersey Institute of Technology, and I've spent the past five years working for the Department of Defense as a civilian engineer. So the perspective that I bring is, I think, two. One, um, the government sector and what it's like to work for the government as a civilian employee. And two, the government is currently funding me through the SMART program to get my PhD. So the perspective of going to work and having them fund the rest of your education for you to keep moving on. That's basically it. Hi, I'm uh, Ashley Weaver. And I actually work with Caitlin in the same lab. I'm a graduate student at Wake Forest University. I'm a PhD student. I'm in my final year. Um, I did my undergrad in biomedical engineering at NC State, and I have a master's degree that I got kind of along the way in graduate school. Um, I have the least e industry experience of anybody on this panel. I did do an internship in undergrad um, working at a medical device company. Um, so I don't know how much of a perspective that I can bring to this panel, but if you have any you know, questions, <laughs> feel free to ask me. Thanks. So hopefully you have a better picture of, of um, who we are um, up here. Uh, and also a little bit about the industry chapters and that they do exist. Um, and then our premise of the gap of, you know, just getting some experience. If you do want to transition into industry, that's what we're talking about. But um, standing at career fairs that Johnson Johnson hosts, I'm one of those guys that's there talking to candidates and trying to screen them going back and you end up with folders of resumes and you have to sort through them somehow. So I guess this is what I want to say to everyone that comes up to me um, and I, I don't really tell them uh, to their face because it's a little too direct. But at the same time, um, don't shove a resume right at someone unless you're prompted for it because then that kind of puts them off. But just go into it you know, have a nice thing, ask some questions, uh, do a little bit of research about the company too before you come up, um, and then just have a basic idea of what the product lines are uh, for it, and that will help you a lot. But part of this is, is landing internships and co-ops um, really helps you land full-time opportunities because at the end of these co-ops and internships, they tend to interview. Um, and all of these things I just want to say is that some people think that internships are made so that the intern can go get coffee or do menial tasks and that. And I have to dispel you with the resource constraints that are put upon us. I could barely travel to come to this meeting <laughs> today. So I'm just saying that you have to fight for everything that you want to do. Um, and that includes hiring uh, a student to help you out and achieve your goals. So you have to get in a room and fight with other people for your intern and, and your position. So there's a lot of thought that goes into that. So. That's one thing I wanted to come, you know, put out there is that a lot of planning goes into some of these co-op and internship programs that, that you may not be aware of. Um, but then it's a trial period for everyone involved. Um, I just have to say that most of the hires that come in as new hires are coming from the, our, you know, the intern or co-op programs just because it's a trial period for everyone. Um, it's a matter of sharing what you you know, can do uh, how you work with something, but then also your eagerness to approach the day. So interview at the end of it, even if you may not be asked about it, but that's just what I wanted to try and share to, you know, from the panel. And this was my slide, so that's why Stephen's making me present it. Um, but in anything, you know, just treat the entire opportunity as a job interview, and if that's where you want to be. But also, I had two internships. One was product development, one was new technology, and I realized which way I wanted to go based upon that. I, I wasn't quite interested in to surfactants and product development like a chemi would be. So the new technology thing was the way for me to go. Um, 
so I'll, let's see even dive into the gaps now. Um, we actually surveyed quite a few people. Um, and what I'm trying to share is, is Gabby is going to share on Saturday morning um, more results and more data, if you will, in this 15-minute presentation. But you're getting a summary of the top-line summary of what the takeaway message was for this particular session. And it was a survey that was conducted by the Boston Industry Chapter, Akshay and Lauren Hauser. Um, and so we just wanted to use it as a sparking, uh, a discussion sparking tool. Yeah, so this is our uh, last slide and then we'll um, open it up to questions and answers. But um, I think there are two important points here. So I showed a slide before, those are like recent graduates. So these are people that we surveyed that had actually uh, had a lot more experience in the field. And these weren't just biomedical engineers, these were also you know, hiring managers and people with electrical engineering or mechanical engineering experience that actually are working side by side with biomedical engineers. Maybe he hired someone for a position and they were, you know, evaluating a biomedical engineer against an electrical engineer or mechanical engineer. And one of the things that really comes out when you talk to more experienced uh, uh, engineers is that they find that it's very helpful if a biomedical engineer has some con concentration. And I think that you know, when we look at resumes a lot of times from someone coming, just coming out of a program, it's like you're highlighting every introductory course that you've taken, which is important. You need to know kind of what direction you're going to have in biomedical engineering, but there's no, like, ability to say where you have any expertise. So I would, you know, advocate that when you're actually putting your resume together is uh, maybe, you know, take a little bit different approach and emphasize what you think your strengths are and not try to just list every single introductory course you took. It kind of actually works against you. Um, the other point was internships and, uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, a strong recommendation that, you know, internships um, are highly recommended by people that, you know, have been out in the field and seeing how that can be very helpful and not just getting the first job, but actually, you know, being successful in your career, um, not just initially, but you know, it has long-term benefits as well. Um, so those are key, two key takeaways. Um, I think what I'd like to do now, uh, you know, as, as a part of the Q&A is maybe we can try to, because I think, is everyone here like in their student BMES chapter, pretty much? Um, so maybe we can uh, provide some ability to like, uh, say how we've been effectively working with those student chapters. And if you're representing student chapters, how you might be able to uh, reach out to, I mean, there aren't a lot of industry chapters, so uh, help get those started in your region. Um, one thing that we're trying to do, we actually piloted it last uh, fall at MIT. We had one of these evening forums, and we decided that um, sometimes to host these events, the, the main uh, challenge is, like, what's the content, and who's the speaker, and, what, and then, you know, assemble the facility, and then it's pretty easy to like assemble, you know, 70 or 80 people. So uh, we actually piloted um, with the student chapter. I'm a graduate of uh, Tulane University. So I contacted uh, one of my professors down there and we actually set up a, through Skype, a uh, kind of a remote broadcast. So they assembled, uh, I think they had about 20 or 30 combination of undergrad and graduate students. And they basically, participated in our um, event that we had in Boston, well, it was actually in Cambridge, um, and were able to ask questions. Uh, we had some challenges with that, but I think that, you know, in the future when we have these events, there's no reason that any student chapter that's willing to participate in something like that, you don't have to be in Boston, they can be in New Orleans, they could be in California, they could be piped in and actually at a minimum hear the content, but we could probably figure out a way that you can ask some questions as well. So that's maybe one thing that we should think about how, you know, the different student chapters through BMES, and it should be organized at the national level, can somehow integrate and link into what we're trying to do in Boston. So that's just one point. So maybe uh, unless anyone else has a comment that's kind of specific about industry chapters and student chapters, we can open it up for discussion. Well, I, I guess an opportunity that Stephen just talked about um, is coming up on November 13th, Tuesday. Uh, we have our next forum happening, and the way BMES industry chapter has been trying to tap into local industry uh, within Boston area is to host these events where it's usually something like this, but it's a bit more structured where we have a presentation, 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 and then we have a discussion afterwards with questions and a, 
and we have a networking session before and then after. But should a student chapter want to partner with us, you know, this is an opportunity to use the Skype method that um, Stephen set up with Tulane. Tulane. So, um, someone first. Just a follow-up comment to that event that's on November 13th. So it, it's kind of odd that so uh, Michael works. Uh, he mentioned Codman, but it's you know the DePue Institute is right there. Um, this is like a world-class facility. Uh, it's funny. My actually my first job in industry was actually for DePue, uh, selling um, uh, joint um, uh, implants for joint reconstruction and sports medicine, trauma, these kind of things. And actually, about six months into that job, I envisioned that really what the field needed was essentially what the DePue Institute is. So it's essentially, they, I think they can seat about, what, 200 people in the facility. Um, they have a bioskills area where essentially, uh, I guess the scenario would be um, if there's a, a new product coming out for total knee replacement, they would have physicians from all over the world come into this facility. They would be able to you know, view a, a surgery um, live, and then they would be able to go in immediately into a bioskills with cadavers and actually learn how to do that procedure that they just watched. And it's, it's amazing. So we're going to use that facility. It'll be the second time that we've used that. Um, and the topic is on uh, around reimbursement, which is a very timely uh, topic. Um, so these are the kind of events we do. So we've had events at, uh, at Depute. So this will be the second one. We've had one at, actually two at Boston Scientific. Um, we've had some at Boston University, some at MIT. Uh, we had one at Medtronic. Um, so that's our ability to, or our motivation to get out and have these events. And what we're trying to do by having it at a company is make it easy for employees that work at that company to actually come in and get involved with the chapter. So with that, um, I'd like to open up for you know questions. And maybe it, if you have any questions about how your student chapter can more effectively you know, interact with industry, that probably is where we should try to focus the discussion. Um, so I have two questions um, related to transitioning into industry, but sort of off topic from where the discussion should be. Um, at Syracuse University, um, this is you know my alma mater is where I'm graduating from in the spring. Um, they really don't differentiate between REUs and internships very clearly. But in industry, does, is there significantly more utility from an internship over an REU? What does the acronym stand for? Oh, uh, the Research Experience for Undergrads from NSF. I mean, in terms of making a distinction between a, a co-op. In an internship, I mean, is is a uh, REU termed as a co-op? Though I'm just trying to build consensus. No, it's something else totally. Mm -hmm. You essentially uh, you get lab experience with uh, principal investigators, and you sometimes can get your own project. And there's usually a publication at the end. If you're asking someone from Johnson and Johnson about an REU and he doesn't know what it means, it probably should have an impact on your decision. Yeah, of course. Uh, an REU is it's a of convenient course. term. It's used by professors to find cheap labor to uh, fulfill their needs, not yeah. the needs of a student looking to transition to industry. OK, thank you. <laughs> also, if you want to participate more in the industry chapters, and you're sort of in the ether of not having a job, is there, uh, can you just show up and participate with the chapters? Or do you need industry experience to be more active? I mean, it, no, it, they're open events to everyone. Um, it's just kind of funny because I'm not wearing a, a Medtronic lanyard out of, out of uh, competition's sake because I have to wear a Codman one. But no offense to Medtronic. But um, in that sense, everyone's welcome to the events. And we have outside people, Covidian, um, you name it, um, that come come and if anything we do have a lot of PhDs that come to network because that's the whole idea is just to start talking to people IP um, venture capital is a whole nother world that's out there too um, and, and it's just kind of interesting though but yeah to the, your research question though earlier um, it's just try and find 
professors, if that industry is what you want to go into and you're getting up in the higher degree levels and the masters and PhD levels that are closely partnered with translating some of their research into what the industry is doing. Because sometimes research can get esoteric to the point where you're that specialized and, and it's to that field, but yet coming up with um, a business case for it and a return on investment, it sounds kind of crass to put someone's life's work in that category but it may not be translatable to a product or, or something like that that could be used in industry. So, okay, thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering, we always, we love to work with industry as a chapter. Um, we're primarily undergrads, and so it's really hard for us to break away from the, we want to talk to industry because we want jobs. We want to bring in like recruiters or hiring managers. Um, and I was just wondering, like, what sort, from a company perspective, first of all, who in the company would you think that we should, like, would be the most beneficial to contact? And then, like, what sort of invitations would you respond more positively to than could you come to, like, a corporate, like, information session, which is based more around hiring? Um, I think, you know, one place where, we're, so where are you a student? Where, what university? Um, I'm from the University of Southern California. Okay. Right on. So, I mean, it's kind of guerrilla warfare. You know, you have to like be a little uh, proactive here and put yourself in the position of not yourself, but who you're trying to reach out to. So, first up, I would actually go to your um, alumni affairs group uh, department and determine who are the biomedical engineers that are actually working in industry that are alums of your institution. The reason is, that, I mean, they have a vested interest in the value of their degree and making sure that those graduates are successfully transitioning into jobs. And so determine who those people are and reach out to them. And uh, that's how I would approach it. Um, you also have the benefit of being in uh, Southern California. So you actually do have medical device companies that are more local. Um, it's funny, I was talking to someone last night who is in uh, Fort Myers, Florida. And uh, she was only aware of like one company, but by talking to someone who's in industry, you know, I was able to put her, or, or uh, I will be able to put her in touch with probably the, the top orthopedic surgeon in the world uh, that's responsible for the uh, uh, Depew's, the top knee system that was ever developed, the low contact stress uh, New Jersey knee. Um, he actually invented it and he lives, he's retired now, but he lives about maybe 15 minutes from where she is. Um, and his son is an orthopedic surgeon now, and they have a company called Mako Surgical, which is this phenomenal company that, you know, uh, that, so that'll be a chance maybe for her to inter interact with that company. So by, you know, actually talking to people that are more experienced, you might be able to connect to a company that's local. Um, but that's where I would start is actually, you know, utilizing what resources you have available, and that would be your alumni department and actually connecting to not just any biomedical engineer, but a biomedical engineer that has a degree from your institution who has a vested interest in your success. Cool. Thank you very much. Also, another comment. Um, one thing that I noticed when I was looking for internships is that a lot of people, they don't use the career development services that the campus has. And there are basically people there who are getting paid to help you find some sort of internship or job. So a lot of times you laugh it off and you say, oh, it's just career development services, I don't need to go there. But that's how I landed my first internship. I went to career development services, I spoke with my rep, he looked at my resume, he asked me what I wanted to do, and he let me know what companies were looking for interns. And that was the way that I got interviews or internships. So that's another way. If um, the networking that you've been doing isn't really working, I mean, it's always try something different. And that's a good different thing to try, especially since you're in Southern California there's probably a lot of companies that have networked with your university that have contacts with career development services. And, uh, just one follow-up comment. Um, one of the benefits of being involved with your student chapter and not just you know, showing up and sitting on the back row and you know, attending, actually being involved in leadership is uh, that can differentiate you from uh, I mean, you're not competing with your, your classmates, you're really competing with yourself and what your potential is and what reality is. Um, and, uh, you know, by being involved and actually 
being in leadership and actually creating you know, some of these events and being able to highlight that on your resume, that has the ability to separate you from you know, the crowd. So just a, a point that I didn't want to forget. Uh, I'm on the faculty at uh, UAB, and so I'm coming from a different perspective. But so the idea of what we could do to our curriculum to help students look better, I guess, you know, as far as uh, industrial positions go. We've done certain things, and I want to see if those are helpful. Uh, we have not done the internship part, but one thing we try to do is set up, we come up with a skill set of what we want our students to be able to do when they finish. We have in industry people on our advisory board, and they've looked at and made sure that that gives them the correct skill sets and didn't add anything to it. Uh, but historically, we've, industry positions have mostly gone through our master students when they go through the program. And part of it is because our undergraduate degree just started this century. It's always strange saying that. Oh. So, but what we try to do with our senior design is make it more so they're trained to be innovators as opposed to just engineers. And the innovative part is the commercialization. There's been lots of talks and will be more at this session or at this meeting about that. So the idea that they go through and have to come up with a, not only a prototype for a client, a local client, usually rehab, but have to think about what would be a marketable type design. And we have business students now in the classroom. So we're trying to model it so it makes them more marketable. But again, I don't know if we're missing the boat or we should be doing other things. So I guess mainly the question is what can undergraduate programs do to make their students marketable within a curriculum besides obviously doing internships? I mean, these are great, great points. Um, and something of great interest, and hopefully this can try to shed some light into how we have to fight for money for projects, even within industry. Um, we're ranking them on a scale from one to six, and, and even there are sub-levels in there in terms of things that we would want to get to, but we don't have funding for right now. And I think if uh, a senior design project could be modeled as to one of those types of smaller projects, if you will, in terms of R&D commitment and resource commitment, that they could be a perfect match for something like that. Like, for example, um, without unveiling too much, but I mean, we have means to determine the repeatability and reliability of a brain temperature sensor for Codman that we're working on. Uh, we have the sensors, but we need someone to develop the sound test method, but then also to use the existing test methods to do that. But yet, because we don't have a dedicated resource for it, it's just kind of, you know, slipping, if you will, in terms of, you know, who's going to get to it, or, you know, we haven't hired someone yet, and, and things like that. But smaller things like that tend to fall into a category, if you will, for things that we could partner better with, you know, academia and, and students, if you will. And as to Stephen's point is, through alumni, you can try to tap into people that are in R&D that can do that kind of thing to structure what a bioengineer could help with. I think a, a point I would make is like, um, you know, contact your technology transfer office and ask them if uh, your university has master research agreements with any companies. If they don't, then they're really behind the curve and they might want to create those with companies like Philips and GE and Johnson and Johnson and these companies. And then the next step would be the Biomedical Engineering Society should get a little more proactive and little savvy and there's really there's no way today for me as a um, as uh, someone working in industry to like really go in and you know search for who's a scientist with a specific skill set at a specific university easily so it's almost like a yellow pages that allows me to look at the schools where we have master research agreements where all the legal issues have been resolved and technology, I mean, IP licensing, it's all negotiated up front. And, uh, you know, from that I might narrow down the list of the ones that would be most attractive. And then I go into the BMES website if it's set up correctly, and I would be able to, within 30 seconds, you know, based on these universities and the skills I'm looking for, bam, I've got that worked out. And then now it's just a contact and, you know, some money and some students and we're off to, the, off to the races, so you know, that's how I would do it. Um, uh, there's another point I was going to make, but it seemed to slip my mind. Okay. 
This is uh, actually a good question, and I thank you for it. And I wish there were more faculty in the audience to, to talk about this. I know what you're talking about, because being in the Board of Directors for the last three years, this discussion came up, uh, the difference between basically what it says there, a concentration or a general education in BME, and which one is better, and what skills are needed. That's why we are running this uh, um, gap analysis to determine that. But I think the answers, well, some of the answers should come from you, being, uh, you know, experiencing that with the students. What do you think? Did that work for you? Did the students, did you have any feedback on, on that program with, with the senior project being a collaborative work? It should come from uh, from the universities, and, and really, what is your feedback? Well, I mean, we just started concentrations. We, uh, this is the first year we have business students in with our BME students, and we've used to kind of have two separate classes, one that did more of the commercialization part, one that did the uh, typical senior design type thing, and this is the first year we've done a better job of integrating it. But the feedback I usually get from students is, they don't like doing the commercialization type stuff while they're at school, uh, but you talk to them five years later when they're out in the real world, they say, well, I wish I spent more time in that because that's what I do all the time. So hopefully we're trying to get better so they understand the importance of that while they're doing their senior design. So we don't have you know, long-term experience of doing this. I'm just trying to see if we're setting it up right and we're doing something that's worthwhile. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that a, a lot of other departments around the country do that, and they have strong, even stronger initiatives in that respect. They even have a master's programs like the Johns Hopkins has, where it's, it's really focused on um, product development and pairing uh, biomedical engineers with uh, business people. And so I think those are those are good skills. And I, being in uh, having been in industry, I like I said, you know, the the business skills are are needed. And um, probably the issue is how we're going to fit all that into the BME curriculum and not still have a good general education, but probably uh, what your solution is, is very good at the level of the senior project already get involved with, with um, a little bit of product development so, so the students have uh, an idea or at least what the skills are and what the challenges are more than, uh, you know, maybe you don't have time to develop your skills in a few months, but at least you have an idea of what Product development means and uh, the market and uh, some some concepts about about that. So. Well, more I was thinking, you know, is that something that they can sell to you guys if they're being recruited? Uh, you know, we do have master's program. We just kind of started the more entrepreneurship thing, and there's a bunch of things now in our business school to do that. So, and historically, we've done very well at placing master's students in orthopedic companies, whatever. But it's what to do at the undergraduate level to make them more marketable and can, by doing a class, our senior design like that, and put that on the resume, does that, uh, I know it's not exactly like an internship, but it's all these skill sets that they now have uh, that probably differentiate them from most engineering students. Do you require a senior project for the undergrads? They all have a year-long senior design. One thing you might want to think about, maybe this is what you're alluding to with the uh, collaboration with the business school is, you know, for each project, um, you know, having someone from the business school involved that's actually, and this, you know, fulfills some of their needs as well is, you know, so the engineering student is really focused on the technical side, but it's very helpful to have a business case around, like, what's the problem you're trying to solve, what's the market, um, you know, what's, uh, I mean, I guess you can't go into too much detail about, you know, the typical thing we'd be doing in the industry, but at a minimum, just, like, what's the, uh, the opportunity and have that high-level business aspect to the project would be helpful and by the engineering students kind of working with, you know, students in other departments, I think it, it makes it a more real-life experience because as engineers, you know, we work with other engineers, but we also work with people in marketing and, and sales and people that didn't take, you know, five semesters of calculus. You need to be able to interact with them just as effectively as other engineers. Well, you know, since we just started putting the business students on each team, so it worked out really nice. So there's one business student per team, and the business students can work together. But probably the more important thing is there is a business faculty who is, uh, although he's on the pharma side rather than the med tech, but he's been, you know, dealing with this sort of thing. So he's in class every day. So we do have someone that has some 
you know, medical experience, um, yeah, right. and helping well, so them yeah. along with it. And so hopefully our engineers get some of those skills as well. Great, thank you. And next question. Sorry, and just another comment to your question. Um, when I was going through college, we had a course. It was designed around small businesses, and they had SBI, SBRI funding. And they brought their projects to us, and it was a business school collaborative and a BME collaborative. And we worked on helping them write the proposal for um, their research funding. So that would be another thing you might want to look into, because not only do they learn how to market a product and do research around a product, but they get to work with a small business that could potentially help them get a job because they ha they've now written this proposal for this company and oh, now we got this money and we're looking for people to hire. So that might be a really good thing to try to look into and see how feasible it is to get it at your university. I was wondering if you could speak briefly on your perspectives of uh, PhDs transitioning into industry, specifically in regard to uh, academia postdocs versus industry postdocs versus going straight into industry career positions, and how you kind of view people coming out with a PhD. That's for me? Um, any, anyone who has a perspective. Okay, well, um, for me, I had a postdoc, a short postdoc of six months, and then I got hired by Gore. <coughs> That's my experience, but uh, of course, you, I, th I think you, know, you finish your PhD, and then you do the postdoc so you can look for a job. You have a little bit of time to look for a job. I mean, if you get a good postdoc in the industry, then th that's probably advantageous, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a way to, but uh, I don't know how easy it is to get those positions. So a any of those experiences would be good. As long as you, you know, you know you want to go to industry, there are d different ways to do it. You can get a, a, a regular postdoc, but maybe it'd be more translational, maybe focus on um, you know, biotech, you know, if that's what you want to do. Or you can get directly a postdoc. I mean, there, there, are, a lot, there are different opportunities. And I don't know if probably a postdoc with the company you want to work for is probably a better opportunity to get a, a full-time job. But um, that's, that's my experience. I, I haven't done the postdoc in industry, unless you consider my experience. But it was a full-time job. It wasn't a postdoc. I mean, I haven't really decided yet. I'm a PhD student. Um, I haven't really decided yet whether I'm going into academia or industry. Um, I haven't officially started my job hunt or anything, but um, like just from talking to some of the companies, I think you know some companies are looking for PhD students. Like some, but they're it's higher level positions typically. Um, and it kind of depends on what you've specialized in for your graduate program because you've been working on something for four or five years and if you're very specialized, I don't know how well that would, if you went to go work for a company that was you know, the expert in that field, I think you'd be in a good position, but I don't know how well just a general company and industry that doesn't specialize in what you've been doing research in for the past five years, how well you would be received. I mean, I, I don't know because I don't have a lot of industry experience. I mean, um, just really quickly, if you're a PhD, you're very specialized and you're becoming an expert in your field. And if I was coming for a career fair looking for entry level positions, I, we actually had to chuck the PhDs because we didn't think they'd be interested in that kind of a job. Um, so it's almost as if you need to find um, a group that's doing primary research in industry that's within your field. Now those are becoming few and far between and the trend is going more to the smaller companies or the startups that are doing more of that pioneering research that would be a better fit for what you can do. Not that companies like J&J &J just buy startups, but that's how we innovate and it's kind of sad, but that's true. And um, some people would argue with me inside, but I mean, we just bought a few, well, we just bought Synthes, which is one of the largest trauma divisions ever. 
And so the complement to Pew's spine and knees and hips and that. So we, stepping back even a little bit further, the pay isn't great for the fellowships, so please make sure it's someone that you can learn from and you can get a lot of papers out of and write for them. And, and that's basically the, the, the win you get from that. And then if you, if you don't like it, then move on. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, postdoc, the postdocs that came in were paid not so much, but they did quite learn quite a bit from my boss, who is a distinguished research fellow in dermatology. So he used to work at uh, Wellman Labs at MGH. So they came for him, not for the conditions, if you will. But it wasn't that bad. But I mean, still, it's not like fantastic, as you know. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is my last year of uh, PhD study uh, from Johns Hopkins University, which I focus on oncology, biochemistry, and cell-based uh, application, and also microfluidic analysis. So I'm like uh, Ashley on the stage. So I would like to add ask the panelists that uh, because I'm scheduled to graduate next May, so I start to look for job, but based on what I'm uh, search on the job posting for the, uh, uh, basically I look for R&D position. So the, the highest level is like a, a principal scientist and the minimum requirement is PhD, but most of this uh, position, uh, they, the requirement is including like uh, at least PhD plus uh, like three to five years of uh, working experience. So I would like to hear from your suggestion that uh, beside uh, looking for the scientist position, should I also look for like associate scientist, which is uh, require only like bachelor or master? And also, uh, should I also uh, look for like postdoc program? Because uh, actually I, I I learned from some alumni, the postdoc program, the, I know the reality is salary. The salary from postdoc program is actually lower than even associate scientists. But in terms of uh, me, uh, I don't really have uh, like many, uh, many different kind of like internship because I, I finished my college and also master and directly go to, uh, to study PhD. So uh, beside, uh, uh, connecting with alumni from Hopkins, uh, their suggestion. So is there any alternative way that if I've, I realize the difficulty in searching for a uh, principal scientist position because the requirement they need working experience, so I may be uh, excluded. So do, do you think I also should look for associate scientists and when I have a more chance to get in, I can like get promoted after a couple of years or uh, it is better that I start from a postdoc in industry. Right. Thank you. Um, I guess just some practical advice. Um, you know, don't look for the perfect job. I mean, you're trying to like transition and to, you know, uh, apply to a spectrum and uh, go that route. But one thing I would suggest that maybe this applies not only to someone that's about to graduate with a PhD, it also would apply to undergraduates as well is one way you can really make a successful transition into industry is not so much getting your first job in industry, but uh, taking um, a research position at a teaching hospital and, you know, set your sights high. And uh, so, I mean, that's how I really, I mean, I, I, I went from being a graduate student working in industry through to Pew. Um, but then I went through a phase where uh, for a number of reasons, I actually went back into to academia for a while to get more clinical experience and to solve a problem that I observed um, being in the operating rooms and was really wanted to, to go after that. And then when I was looking to make the transition back into industry, I felt like I could do that the most effectively by being at a teaching hospital that all the companies were like wanting to interact with. So. I basically was, you know, recruited to Boston to work at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, uh, which is a teaching hospital for Harvard Medical School, and uh, you know, led, you know, the R&D arm for this lab, and worked with probably about ten different companies. Uh, we, you know, launched three products from like concepts through, you know, FDA approval, you know, to market, and that allowed me to demonstrate 
you know, what I was capable of doing. And then eventually I just decided that I wanted to work for one of those companies. And so that's how I like transitioned back from academia into uh, industry. So as you're looking and you have the benefit of being, you know, at, at Hopkins. So, you know, don't just look within your department. I mean, look at the medical school and try to identify who are the, um, I mean, yeah, I guess you can't, you have specialized, so you can't be too broad, but within your, your expertise at the, uh, the hospital, you know, how can you best apply that expertise and link to someone who has, they're either a consultant to industry or they have like ties to industry and you probably within a very tr quick turnaround time, you know, within six to months to a year, you could make an effective transition in the industry that way. So I'm not saying that that's, you know, plan A, but it should be plan B or plan C. And, you know, you need to have, it's like, if you haven't read the book Art of War, you should read it. <laughs> we have time for two more or so questions. I'm open for any questions. When searching for a co-op or an internship, I generally encounter the problem that with companies that are produce medical devices or have healthcare divisions, they're traditionally looking for electrical engineers or mechanical engineers. So how would I market myself as a biomedical engineer, especially when lacking a concentration? Uh, do what I did. I went into the sales. So the advantage of sales is you can um, uh, have a technical background and be in the field where all the problems are occurring and you solve the problem. So essentially what I did was uh, I didn't go just directly into sales. So I, in grad, as an undergrad and a, as a graduate student, I uh, worked on worked the team that basically invented and created laser vision correction. So I was there for like patient one through 50. And then I uh, you know, transitioned and was looking uh, for the next step. I kind of got bored with ophthalmology after a while. So I was like, get out of this. And I decided that my department was very focused on you know, orthopedic devices and orthopedic surg surgery. So I transitioned into that. Fortunately, I knew an alum who was actually a, um, working in the uh, division that was focused on knee replacement. And so he was able to put me in touch uh, with some hiring managers. And so I actually I interviewed for a position um, in Warsaw, Indiana, of all places, where it's like the kind of the hub of the orthopedic device industry. But if you grow up on a cotton farm, you don't want to live in the cornfields of Indiana. So I, I still went up and interviewed. I wanted to meet people and really understand that. But, um, and they did, they offered the, the position to me, but I told them that what I really wanted to do was that job, but in Austin, Texas. And so they said, well, we can't make that happen, but we're actually looking to, um, you know, hire someone in sales in that area. And so we worked out a deal where, you know, I mean, my salary is still based on, you know, selling product, but I was kind of the eyes and ears for um, product managers and engineers and was in there like trying to determine, you know, how we can make products better. And I was like in surgery every morning and then on the phone talking back to the engineers and like, have you thought of this, have you thought of this? And uh, that was actually very, I did that for five years actually. I, I, so I was with Depew for a year. And then after a year, uh, I was convinced that I knew more than anyone else. And so I started my own company and moved back to Louisiana. And instead of working for one company, I worked for about 25. Um, and uh, really specialized in not just uh, like knee replacement, but other things. And, um, and again, I was really uh, selling product, but I was interfacing with uh, developers and uh, every company that's represented at this meeting. Innovation is challenging right now because essentially the US market is growing about 5% a year. That means that our revenue will double every 14 years. We, we're basically set up to be growing at about 15% a year because that would double about every 3.8 years. So uh, innovation is very challenging. We have to, you know, defend every single project that we have with the business case around it. And so, you know, if you're looking for that development position, it's going to be challenging, but every company has product on the shelf that they need to sell tomorrow. And so, I mean, not everyone can do sales. It does require some you know, specific skills, it's not look pretty, it's basically just deal with rejection and just do whatever it takes to win. But that's biomedical engineering, right? And so that's, you know, something that if you find, and this is to everyone, I mean, when I was looking for jobs, it was very challenging at that time. The economy was very similar to this now, that was, you know, 25 years ago. Um, it uh, should be, you know, maybe it's not your plan A, but at a minimum it should be plan D or E. 
It's, it's a viable option, and you can learn a lot because you're in the field, and uh, that could be your pathway to getting the kind of position that you really want. Okay, we're at, I think we're at time, though, right, for the session? Or Come on. Don't. We can do one more question? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Um, so I'm a senior, and I'll be graduating this spring, and I'm really not sure what direction to go. We've talked in here a bunch about experience and everyone's asking experience and how does industry view that experience so with me i'm trying to decide do i go on to masters do i go right into the industry do i consider co-op options then masters do you do thesis or non-thesis and it's or do you do the masters first and then go into industry so there's all kinds of options i'm just kind of curious with what choice by taking a certain avenue how would that affect opportunities in industry with careers later on. Masters. <laughs> so a thesis or non-thesis, it doesn't matter. Well, it depends on the program. Okay. What the requirement of the program. Well, there's the non-thesis route, there are some capstone projects where there's research papers, and then the thesis, it's more lab work research. So is that the research, is that something that's kind of industry basis or? Probably more research oriented it would be better to get the experience, hands on experience on a certain subject. That would give you an advantage over the, and the masters won't put you into the PhD, uh, you know, uh, bucket. So you have, so you may be looking for totally different positions. Even master will still allow you to get an entry position, but it will give you something in addition to the rest. Just real quickly, don't be so focused on the degree and all the different options. Focus on the story that you want to be able to tell when you're in front of someone in an interview. Another tactic that's very helpful, and actually I learned this from a student, actually it was interviewing for an, in, uh, for an internship. You know, go in there, just play like you're an art student that has a portfolio. I mean, even as an undergraduate, you had a number of projects which you had to do. So summarize those projects with maybe a few key graphs you know, print it out on a piece of paper, go to, uh, you know, Kinko's or wherever you can buy this little binder, it's like four or five dollars. You know, put, you know, create ten pages of like, you know, a graphic way to tell a story about who you are, what you did, what excited you about those projects. And be focused on like building that portfolio over the next three or four months because you'll be interviewing. And I guarantee you that if you go in with something like that, you're probably one of a hundred people that might have thought of that. And that's, Maybe the thing that you know can set you apart, but don't be so focused on the degree and all the. I mean, focus on the story and then determine how you can best tell that story and what's the best path because it's different at your university from somewhere else. There, are, you know, pros and cons of each, uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses of each program, and really focus on what's the strength at your at your program. So, so with that portfolio, I know we're short on time, but with that portfolio, is it important to kind of drag out that master's just to get different experiences throughout to build on that portfolio or just to get that master's out of the way and just kind of have that be your main capstone of your portfolio? How would you suggest to do that? Um, yeah, if, if you need, if you feel like to round out, you know, and be able to tell a more persuasive story that you need another year to do that and you could accomplish that through a master's, then by all means do that. Um, but just don't feel like by having an additional degree that it makes your job any easier finding a job. Uh, it's just a piece of paper and um, uh, I mean it has value. I don't want to diminish the value. I mean I'm, I'm very proud of you know all the work that I did and, and I highlight that when you know at, at when it's needed. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, we're hiring people, not, you know, the diploma. So really focus on being able to tell a persuasive story and who you are and what excited you about that project because, you know, we want people that are very passionate about their, what they're doing because we're not hiring people to work 40 hours a week. Right. All right. Thank you all. I very appreciate it. Um, also, sorry, to that point, um, if you take the if you're going back for a master's and you take that opportunity to do a co-op or an internship, that's great. But if you just go back for a master's and it's basically just another year of education with no work experience, it's it's really not going to set you apart. Okay. Um, so 
one thing that you might want to do if you do have internship or co-op experience now is to start applying for entry-level jobs. And some, and if you're really interested in a master's, sometimes they will actually pay for it or they'll pay a portion of it. So if if you currently have funding to get a master's and you want to use that to build your portfolio, definitely focus on internships and co-ops while you're doing that because if not, then it is going to just be another piece of paper that might not help you. But if you already have that sort of experience, it would be great to try to get an entry-level position and then someone else pays for your master's. So you basically get a master's for free, which is great because then it's the best of both worlds. You get to work and you get a degree for free. So it looks better in both ways. Thank you, Trisha. Can I just make a quick statement? I'm, I'm was faculty and now I'm in industry. And so um, like, if that's what you want to do, one of the things that drives me nuts is when former students contact me and they're like, hey, Dr. V, we know you're working, congrats. And then they're like, can you hook me up with somebody at Genentech or can you hook me up because they see my profile on LinkedIn and that's all they tell me and that's it. Don't do that. Tell me what you're interested in at that company. If you make these connections and if you network and if you volunteer, if you're a PhD student, you should be volunteering at the conferences that are industry based. You should be the face that they see at check-in. You should be the face that they see moderating the sessions, running the whatevers and helping out. You shouldn't just be in the lab. You need to branch out a network, but then when you do network, you need to say, hello, this is what I'm interested in. I see that you're connected to this person at this company. Do you know anybody who's in their drug discovery? Do you know but anybody who's in their device? This is what I'm really interested in. Don't just ping a contact and be like, I'd really like to be connected to your connection at this company. Well, great, big deal, why? You know, like if I'm willing to do it for you, and for a lot of my former students, I am, they need to tell me what they're interested in specifically. Because I have five contacts at Genentech, but if you want to be in their marketing department and I connect you up with R&D, it's not going to be a good fit. So like that would just be, as somebody who's done a lot of different things in my career and you know did teach and am now back in industry, that's really frustrating for me. And it, it makes you look bad because then I'm less likely to respond to that person's post in the future. Because I'm like, all you're going to tell me is now you're interested in this company, not why, not what's changed, you know. So. Build relationships with your contacts. Use these kind of events to meet people and figure out what you're interested in and really know what your game plan is, all right? Like, so I started school a long time ago, but I wanted to do ortho stuff. I am now very happy at an orthopedic company, okay? So it may be a weird road to get there, but use all of these ways um, to do it and give more information than, hey, I'm interested in this company. So anyway, thanks. I don't know what to do as a summary statement, but thank you all for your discussion, your time, your focus and that. And, and we'll be here for questions too afterwards, so come on up. And I think we're all in the directory, right? So you can haunt us for, for that. But and it's, the, thank every one of you for this wonderful session. Um, I know that I enjoyed it sitting in the back as a faculty member, and I know the students enjoyed it too. So thank you very much. And thank you to Michael and Ashley for organizing it. We really appreciate it.